Good morning, everyone. We're just gone nine o'clock. Um, welcome to our webinar on interim leadership. Um, I'm Linda Griffiths. I'm Director of Executive Search at Prospectus. Uh, so I oversee all of our director, chief executive appointments, um, permanent or interim, um, as well as a highly regarded board appointments practice. Um, at Prospectus and, and across the sectors more broadly, we've seen interim leadership playing an increasingly crucial role uh, in maintaining continuity, driving change, and achieving goals during organizational really significant transitional periods that many have been going on, uh, particularly post-pandemic. Um, and we thought this would be a useful opportunity to talk a little bit more about how to leverage maximum value from an interim. Um, maybe you're considering whether to use an interim or not, what's going to work best for, for you, and how to, to optimize outcomes of an interim uh, to set a strong foundation for future success. So we will uh, be providing some insights and strategies for, for harnessing the potential of an interim. Uh, and these are going to be told from the perspective of two high experienced interim professionals from our network, uh, Elizabeth Balgobin and Darcy Myers. Elizabeth, would you like to kick off by introducing yourself and perhaps a little bit more about your route into an interim career? Hello, I'm Elizabeth Balgobin and I'm um, uh, Chief Executive of the Bowlby Centre, which is a mental health charity. Um, technically part-time, but it's a small charity, so <laughs> part-time has no meaning. Um, this is not an interim role I'm in now, um, but for 12 years I was doing interim work, CEO and other roles in the sector. I've been in the sector for nearly 35 years and the route into interim was a bit of an accident really. <laughs> I became an accidental interim and then discovered I liked it and funnily enough I was remembering that it was a role that prospectors had on but hadn't sent to me. Somebody else <laughs> had contacted me um, uh, about the role and I didn't think much, uh, uh, I hadn't really thought about what being an interim would be but I applied um, and ended up getting it and discovered the joy of actually having a time limit on something that you could do. Um, so I'm an accidental interim uh, and maybe again at some point. Fantastic. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, accidental interims also very welcome. <laughs> uh, Darcy, would you like to introduce yourself and yeah, be interested to hear a bit about your routine? Thank you, Linda. Yeah, um, like Elizabeth, I'm an, I was an accidental interim, but um, so my path to that was, um, and I've been in the voluntary sector, um, in a, I'm in my third, third decade as well, um, started off as a VSO volunteer, then did a lot of project work, um, and then became chief executive of a, of a charity, and saw big growth and change there, and I went on to run another charity and, and, and did similar things there. And then the third charity, which I was actually poached by the, uh, the founder and the chief and the chair into doing, uh, I spent nine months of frustration that they had some really, really serious issues. Um, they wanted solutions, but no change. They didn't want me to change anything, uh, which was, of course, quite challenging to actually uh, turn that around. So after nine months, I said, look, you're, you know, it's frustrating for you, it's frustrating for me, you're actually wasting charitable money if you're not taking the advice you've, you've, uh, you've, you're paying to have. Um, so we parted company. And two of the trustees said to me on separate occasions over the next month or so, if you'd come in as a consultant, we'd have listened to you. But because you are our new CEO, we felt we needed to mould you into what we thought we wanted. And I thought, well, that's daft, isn't it? You know, you're paying all that money. Um, and I did an interim role because it came up and I needed to, uh, to work. Um, and then I understood what they meant, um, that I was going in to that role with a really clear brief to, to bring the change that was needed. Um, and I was then given the reins to do that. And that's really what they were referring to. So that, that was my route into interim. And I've now been doing that for 12 years, I think. Very good. And, and we'll be delving into uh, a little bit more of those stories uh, as we go, I think. Thank you. Um, so I've you know, um, got a few questions that I thought it would be helpful uh, to go through with Elizabeth and Darcy to, to get some insight from them. And um, also really happy for everyone that's joined us um, if you have questions, 
um, that you'd like me to raise, um, do please pop them in the chat. Um, that's where I'll, I'll pick those up and in a little while uh, see what's coming through and, and pose some of those on your behalf to Elizabeth and Darcy. Um, so what I'd like to start off with is, you know, perhaps with, with you, Elizabeth, um, tell me a bit about the things that you look for when taking on an interim role. Um, what makes you perhaps choose one over another, makes one more appealing than another? There's a, a lot of opportunities out there at the moment. There are, and um, uh, some of it is about what's happening in your life at that moment. One of the things about being an interim is that you might choose to do interim because you can fit other things into your life if you can get that right. On the other hand, taking on a role might mean that all of the things that you plan to do for yourself can't happen. So it's weighing up some of those things. Is the role juicy enough for you to say, for this period, I'm going to put aside other plans that I have or is it a role that will fit with what I want to do the primary thing I want to do uh, at the moment uh, for me it's always going to be a bit about cause-led it's things that are going to interest me so I get offered quite a lot of things you know would you apply for and um, I'm not into football <laughs> Running an organisation that's primary work is around football is just not going to be the thing that's going to appeal to me. But I've also taken on things where I felt a personal pull towards the the issue, but have um, have haven't really thought of myself as a professional working with that. Um, so two of them, both through um, prospectus, was domestic abuse charity where um, a cause that's really important to me, but I would never have applied for that as a permanent role because I wouldn't have seen uh, how they would appoint me. But actually, as, as the interim, I've gone on. Um, I went back to them as their interim after their CEO that came in, uh, left after a few years. They've had me back several times and I continue to support them. Um, and then did other domestic abuse charities. And uh, one was um, uh, a, a drugs, uh, an alcohol service for the alcohol service running that charity. And they specifically wanted um, someone who was not from the sector so that they would have a clear view of what was happening in their organisation, a proper fresh pair of eyes. And those sorts of things appeal to me because uh, one, it's something that's important to me as a cause, but I also learn something and I can impart something that helps the organisation improve. So it's lots of different factors. Sometimes it's also about the distance. It is easier for me perhaps to travel to Newcastle than to get to Croydon. Because in, even though I'm in London and Croydon is closer, <laughs> the journey will be longer for me to get to Croydon so I might kind of go not Croydon but I will travel as far as Newcastle <laughs> and have done and um, have done <laughs> <laughs> thanks Elizabeth I think it's quite interesting that as an interim you can explore entirely new sectors um, and yeah. that you are valued for your experience outside of that sector mm. uh, perhaps in a different way and yeah of course practicalities are are also a key a key factor Darcy anything to to add to the above from your perspective and I'm, I'm also interested in in your view on the key differences between an interim and a permanent role. Well obviously there's something about Newcastle because I've worked in Newcastle as well and I loved it, absolutely loved it, loved the organisation I was working for there as an interim CEO um, and I live in West Sussex so it couldn't have got much further away um, and, and as you can imagine I didn't do that on a daily commute um, but so um, I think for me the the drivers that you know, for whether I would work with an organisation or not is yeah I do need to feel some um, connection to the to the cause but I don't expect that I will be an expert in that, mm. in that field. And they shouldn't, I think that's what a, a key difference between the permanent and, and, and the interim is that you wouldn't be necessarily looking for somebody with the expertise of the cause, but what you're looking for is someone with the expertise of dealing with the issue that you have and why you need an interim. So you don't normally have an interim because you planned it. You have it because something has you know, gone out of, out, of, out of kilter for whatever that reason is. So what I'm always looking for is, 
you know, do I like the people I'm going to work with? Can I can can I work with that that team? For me, it's normally the um, the board. Um, and, and will will we be able to to work towards that solution together? Um, and will I be the right person to help them get there? So can I really make a difference? And that is my filter. Um, so the second part of the question was about you know, the difference between the interim and the permanent role is that you are not there as the next CEO. And I think I always make it very clear to the board and to, the, to my SLT and, and, and staff is that I'm not your next CEO. I'm helping you get in the position of recruiting the right CEO for the next role and bringing clarity um, and addressing some of those issues helps the board you know, define that who they're looking for. And so they make the right appointment and, and that appointment then um, takes them on to the next stage. So you're able to be much more surgical, I think, than um, than you would do as a, as a permanent. And you don't also you don't have the um, the need to worry about the internal politics um, and the probation period where you're trying to be nice to everyone while you're embedding yourself. You can you're hitting the ground running, um, and you're bringing that ability to be very agile um, and and get on with lots of different types of people very quickly. Thanks, yeah, Darcy. I, mean, I, I would just add to that 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 was actually one of the things that was really um uh, a revelation to me doing that first interim roles because I wasn't involved in the organizational politics because I didn't have to take on that long-term view of how I'm going to work with this person in three years time it kind of freed up a bit of my thinking about how you approach things um and sometimes and actually it's one of the things that I've gone in and fixed where a CEO has become too friendly, perhaps, you know, the boundary between what your role is as the CEO, either with the board or with your staff team, gets a little blurred. And people th when things go wrong, it gets messy. And going in and, and being the word you used is surgical. It's, it's not quite the word I would use. I'm not sure what I would use, uh, but actually being clear headed that I am there. I am friendly towards you, but I can't be your friend. There is a boundary. And, and I might just add, you know, that you know, when you go in as a as a as an interim or a permanent, you're you're going in with fresh eyes. You're a new member yeah. of staff. You, you, you know, you're going in with fresh eyes. And you know, if I was going in as a permanent, um, I'd be write, writing on my observations down and thinking, well, I might come back to that later on. Mm. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll just wait until the moment's right. But as the interim, you're you're collecting those and dealing with them straight away. So there is there is that there's more urgency, I think. Yes, and the it's thing I do there is I I ask um, uh, I tell the board. <laughs> Actually, I'm not asking them. I am very clear. I'm telling the board that I will meet with them within the first month to give them those observations before I stop seeing the things. There's some questions coming up in the in the chat. Um, Elizabeth, um, yep. it's some interest in, in why you took on that permanent role rather than staying uh, with interim. And also some questions coming up about your seniority um, going into interim leadership and whether, you know, what level you need to be at as a leader or, or chief mm. executive before going into that. OK, so for me, um, I had been a chief exec in permanent roles before I became an interim. Uh, but the year before I took on that first interim role, I was essentially doing consultancy for different people. Um, uh, so and I was fairly well known. I was running an umbrella organisation. I had a magazine column and, you know, so so people knew me. Uh, I wasn't going in as a an unknown um, it, to some extent for people and that possibly made it easier uh, the permanent role now was uh, I the accidental interim bit it has interested me it's given me a lot of things but I actually wanted to be a permanent again and that is one of the pitfalls of doing interim is that people then see you as only interim um and so when I have applied for permanent roles I've got very close and feedback has often been we don't think you'll stay because you do interim work um which is very frustrating um this is a permanent role but it's a small charity and as we know <laughs> things are only as permanent as the money that you can bring in 
coming in. So um, there's a bit of me that's carrying a little bit of interim still in in that role of trying to keep that level of awareness and not get um, not lose the things I've learned as an interim whilst doing this permanent role. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Some clients, you know, do have some questions when they look at CVs when there's been lots of interim. But I also think increasingly they are seeing the opportunity there for the breadth of experience mm. and challenge mm. that you have dropped into uh, and, and gained from being an interim that plays so well to your next permanent role. Good. OK. Um, Tell me a little bit more about what has enabled you both to be most most effective in your interim um, roles uh, when you really feel that you've been able to make the very the best impact possible and perhaps some of the conditions that that enabled that. Darcy? Um, yeah, okay. Um, I think one of the things that I find really helpful, um, and uh, you're quite right, you know, it's that breadth of experience. You know, you've you've worked with quite a different number of organizations. With different challenges, um, um, but they're all as interim CEO. So you you you've got that that variety as well. But I think the thing that really works for me, helps me is that I'm also an active trustee. So mm -hmm. I really understand what it's like to sit on the other side of the table and have the frustrations of uh, of res limited resources and you know, changing world around us, um, changing needs, changing um, uh, funding and everything else. So as going in as a, as, a, as an interim CEO, I'm able to really work with that board, those boards, and understand where they where they are. But again, I go back to this: uh, well, can I work with the person? So the key for me in that relationship is is working with the chair and ensuring that um, that is going to be a, a good experience for both sides. Um, but because I'm experienced with being a chair as well, I understand that perspective. The other thing is, and it's part of my filter, if you like, um, is understanding what drives uh, the board to be trustees. So I have three questions that I, um, I ask every trustee I meet, and those questions help me understand what their motivations are um, and, and where their where their possibly where their fears might be as well. So what do I need to you know how do I need to manage that relationship as well? And I do the same thing um, with the people that I'm going to be working with um, as as the interim, whether that's senior leadership team. Um, and I go as deep as I can. When I was working in Newcastle, it was over a thousand staff. So obviously I couldn't have a one-to-one -one with everybody. Um, but we, we, we I, I ensured that was a mechanism so everyone could talk to me in some way or another. And when I'm doing that early on in the first week or so, it's uh, off the record. Tell me what you want to tell mm -hmm. me conversation uh, so I can understand where everyone's coming from. Uh, and that really that really helps set um, a good foundation for the for the rest of the role. I do exactly the same is that um, saying to people, right, <laughs> let's get to know each other. This is your chance to tell me all of the things um, and I can translate that. I can't promise I can fix everything, but I can translate that back to the board and into the plans um, where it's appropriate. Um, and I've forgotten what the bit was that you were asking. <laughs> the original question, because I'm picking up on that. Um, Just a little bit about the conditions that have enabled you to be most impactful. And successful oh, in yeah. So, um, uh, so it's different things, but all of them is about seeing something that is a change. Um, uh, one of those bits is that you can't then take the glory of what happens afterwards. What you've done is created the good soil for something to to grow into. So um, uh, for an organisation, I started the work to create a partnership for funding and delivery. Um, so the money would come in and then lots of other charities would benefit from that all by working together now that's a great project it's great you know it's held for eight years now as a partnership and as a delivery model but nowhere along the way would people credit it to me um, but it's amazing to see that really good work is able to go on from something that I in initiated eight years ago and set the foundation for um, another one that's not quite as positive on, on one level is actually pointing out to a board 
that they could not continue, that they would be insolvent if they continued. And it was too late getting in an interim to do that turnaround. And so ending elegantly mm. would be better um, than leaving people scrabbling around. So when you go in in crisis and you can see it's too late, that you know the work needed to have started six months before, a year before, to fix things. It feels horrible doing it, but um, uh, but it's actually better in the long run that people are given a chance to to leave well. Mm. That um, your clients and service users know what's happening. You can celebrate what people have enjoyed and mourn what you're losing. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, no, that's that's very important to hear. Darcy, there's there's a quite a bit of interest in in the three questions that you referred to uh, that you asked trustees. Are you able to give us any insight? Into well, I those? saw that. I yeah, saw that in the chats. Yes, um, you could email me separately, and I'll tell you secretly. <laughs> no, um, I just before I answer that, I just echo what Elizabeth was saying about the timing for bringing an interim in. Um, and often um, I've ex experienced that. I'm sure you have seen it many times in the mm. where a board has thought that they could muddle through themselves for a period. So somebody on the board steps up and, or, you know, to do the, and they, after a year, they, or whatever, they decide actually do, they can't do it. We better have get an interim in. And that year has been a critical negative moment for the, for them for turnaround. Um, so you're then into a, into a, into a very difficult situation. Um, and as you say, finding a way to, for, to help people move on and exit um, uh, positively, um, even if it's not the ending of the charity, um, and you might be coming up with uh, hard solutions. But one example, one organisation that I ran as an interim, a third of the staff were needed to be made redundant because they weren't actually delivering the charitable objectives. There had been quite a bit of mission drift um, and the funding had gone from the um, the projects that weren't really part of the mission, but the, the staff had stayed. And during the exit interviews, all of the staff, bar one of them, said thank you um, for helping me move on. Um, it's right for me. I love the charity and I'm going to carry on being an advocate for it, but it's right for the charity as well. Um, but it plays to one of the things that is quite difficult about being an interim is that you do get really emotionally attached to the organisations mm. you're working with because you couldn't do a good job if you weren't. You know, you've got to really love what you're doing. Um, and then you have to hand it back after a really short period of time. Um, and a lot of the organisations that I've worked with, I've stayed in contact with, I've given yeah. to give advice and guidance, and I'd always do that anyway. Um, but it's, you know, you need to know that you're here for the as an interim. You're not here as the, or for me anyway, I'm not there as the interim to become become the, the permanent. Um, so I will I will answer those three questions because they're, they're, they're quite short. Um, so I always ask any trustee, I say, why did you want to become a trustee of any charity? Why would you take on the role of a trustee? Why this charity? And what would you like to see achieved in your time as a trustee? And the last question, it's very important it's phrased that way, because what I'm looking for um, out of all those three, but particularly the last one, is whether they answer from a personal perspective or from an organizational perspective. Is that, you know, if they say, I'm looking to achieve me, I'm looking to achieve a professional mm. development or whatever it is, that's the motivation. And there's nothing wrong in that, um, providing it's not nefarious. You know, um, the, but what you need, to, then I need to, I can then understand what their motivations are, how I can help them achieve that, um, how they how I can help them be an effective trustee. But if you understand how, how that board then works and the dynamics of that board, you can often... Um, uh, you know, address some of those those dynamic issues that, that, that might be happening at one mm -hmm. organisation. I asked the chairman. I said, "Do you do you all know each other very well?" He said, "Oh yes, we know each other. We've known each other for years." And I said, "Oh, that's really good. And maybe after the next board meeting, we could go and have, all have supper together." And he thought that was a good idea. They hadn't done it before. And as we walked to the restaurant, I could hear them saying, "So, do you have children?" And they didn't know each other personally. They understood. They knew each other professionally. They they were all all in that profession of that in of that charity, but they actually didn't know each other very well. So when it came to making hard decisions, they, there wasn't the robustness of the team there because they actually had a very shallow engagement with each other. So those three probing questions really help. Thank you, Darcy. Now that's really helpful to hear. Mm. Um, 
How, how would, would either of you advise preparing moving? There's a lot of interest in the room about people thinking about, you know, embracing an interim career that, you know, have been permanent for quite a long time. Uh, and yeah, how to, how to best pre prepare themselves for that? Um, uh, well, you're asking two accidental interims, but um, <laughs> thinking about um, what I might have done, uh, actually that bit of doing consultancy before, did was a, a bit of preparation because as a consultant you're going in and 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 being laser focused on on something it's time limited you're working within a boundary um that people understand and back to Darcy's original point to uh, you know someone saying if you'd have come in as a consultant instead of the permanent we would have listened to you so there's a bit of understanding can you do that can you separate the bit of you that is really passionate about something and be, going back to Darcy Surgical, but clinical about um, the work that you're doing and what you're focusing on? The other thing is having a confidence to in your abilities and the breadth of knowledge that you have. So not all interims are CEO. Mm. I've done interims where I haven't been the CEO um, and that's been interesting too for me because after you know decades of being a CEO you might forget what it's like for everybody else and so going as an interim where I'm not the CEO and seeing how a permanent CEO is acting or what other people are feeling you get to be a bit more matey with people um, and hear other things that you won't hear um in the organization so there's a bit of tapping into to some of that as well and then the other thing I think that is really important is being really clear about the confidentiality boundary on this as an interim you will be privy to organization that you might go into a competitor organization at some point but the boundary around the confidentiality about the work that you did and the knowledge you have about that organisation has to be maintained. Um, so going and talking about uh, all of the ins and outs and what you found in an organisation, that's a complete no-no for me. Thanks, Elizabeth. Darcy, anything else to add in, in yeah. terms of yeah, preparation, moving from permanent to interim, and, and anything about building networks? There's quite a bit of interest about you know you're somebody that might be based in the northeast able to travel more broadly how how you make potential clients aware of that yeah i i think the one thing that was uh, you know a bit of a shock for probably more for my wife than for me was that um the, that you know boom and bust in almost you know that by the very nature of interim you will need when you're needed um and it's you know it's a relatively short period of time um and then you're back on the market um and you know waiting for the next one to, to come up really mm -hmm. so to begin with when you know when I was you know first doing this there were quite big gaps between the various interim roles um and what I hadn't you know grown at that stage was the other parts of my consultancy so I do mentoring and board de development and training and you know, strategic analysis and things like that and provide a secretariat for small charities so I've grown those little extra skills and little offerings which can run alongside doing interim work um so they um then that um helps um, smooth out my cash flow um and uh, my wife you know is is more comfortable about all this now you know a dozen years on um and um so I think finding if you're thinking about moving from a permanent role to to doing interim work is thinking about what other th other offer you have in your in, in your in your portfolio so you can you can smooth that out and that gives you some reassurance as well. Um, and building the network um, is is absolutely vitally important. Um, so I was lucky enough that a lot of the work that I've been doing over the years um, had been um, with lots of different sectors. So different, the three charities I was permanent of, they were in different different sectors, and I built that network up there. I built that network then, um, 
and have always been keen to share. So, um, as you know, I was one of the founding trustees of the Small Charities Coalition, and that's, that ethos is based on, on sharing and, and supporting each other. So being involved in that before becoming an interim, I think would really help um, grow that and and getting to know you know prospectus and, and other organizations as well so they understand what your drivers are and how you can help them uh, with them, what they're doing um, and you work as a team and, and that's that's your bigger team yeah. hmm. and I was an interim for small charities coalitions <laughs> 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 and I, I just add to to that bit about that cash flow and uh, the element that there always happens, that negotiation about what you're going to be paid um, for your role. So people might think they're paying a lot for an interim. I I negotiate because I'm very aware of small charities, for instance. Um, so I, I am willing to go on to PAYE if that makes it easier. But then they have to understand that that comes with that bit of there's annual leave then that's factored into that. Whereas if they were paying me on a day rate, that would not be there. Um, uh, I have not been generous to myself. So where I've done chunky interims, you know, over six months, nine months longer, I haven't taken the pension option because I know how tricky that is for organisations adding that in. Um, but you have to plan for those things for yourself. So... Uh, as Darcy says, you know, there are very lean periods. There seems to be lumpy times when all of the interim roles all appear um, and you are spoilt for choice and you kind of go, I want to do them all. They look all really interesting. <laughs> um, uh, and then there are periods where everything's very settled for whatever reason um, in the market. People aren't moving around. Um, so we saw that. After the 2008-2009 bust, everyone hunkered down for a while and people weren't moving around. And then they kind of felt, OK, it's safe again. And that led to more interims. And I think the same is happening now. If you're seeing more business post-pandemic, it's kind of like, OK, we've got to stay and sort this bit out. And now it's, OK, I've done my time. <laughs> Let's move on. And so that creates that market. So you have the, these peaks and troughs. Um, the challenge with the consultancy bit I have found is that um, if you've got a chunky piece of consultancy and an interim role, you have to let the consultancy bit go. And I will only pass people on to consultants I know and trust. And then you lose that consultancy because they they go with somebody else. So really planning what you actually need coming in can determine what choices you make about what which interim roles you take yeah and you have to be realistic about your you know you know, you know the actual amount of time you you need to do mm. whatever you're doing and do it really well you know mm. so you mustn't spread yourself too thin and you burn yourself out of course and that's that's a, a danger for for anybody any in any role but I, I think one of the, you know, as, as Elizabeth said, people, you know, it can look like having an interim is very expensive, but I always think about it from an opportunity cost. If you don't solve the problems you've got and why you bring in interim in, that's going to cost you an awful lot more. And if you, for me, as an interim CEO, if the board appoint the wrong CEO and have to go back to market, um, and, um, and that can be really expensive um, and, and, and potentially quite damning for the organisation as well. If they have the wrong CEO in for a year um, or whatever it is, that can actually do a lot of uh, damage. So the investment in getting the interim in to really bring that focus and, and, and make solve those those problems, those issues, is actually money well, well invested. Um, and I use a calculator to say that, that I'm pegging my day rate against the, to the cost of the permanent CEO. So I don't say I only work with charities of a certain size or a certain turnover or a certain, you know, what a, it's actually, you know, my day rate will be proportionate to the size of that organization. And if I want to work with them, I'm happy to work at a lower rate because mm -hmm. if I see that um, I like what they're trying to do, I think I can be of real help to them, um, and you know we're going to work well together to get to, to that solution together. Then that's the motivation for me. The money isn't the motivation, but I do need to pay the mortgage. 
Remember that when Darcy's next quoting you for some uh, interim work. No, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, and that isn't that isn't. I'm not going to tell you what my calculation is on this meeting, but I'm happy to share with, with people who want to directly ask me. Thanks, Darcy. That's great. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about the differences of, of interim and permanent roles. Um, again, have you have you been doing an interim role and then ever been really tempted to take on the permanent role? Interested in in your mm -hmm. responses to that? Yeah, shall I shall I kick off with that? Is that right, Liz? Um, yeah, almost every time because as I say, you get really emotionally attached to the organisation. You can see the potential of where it's going next. And think, oh, I'd love to be on that journey. You know, particularly if you've helped bring clarity to that strategy. Um, and it's not obviously it's not your strategy; it's the strategy of the organisation. Um, but it, it's it's really tempting. And I but I think it's a real danger. Because unless that is something you intended to do with the board, and they were, it was an option at the beginning, you know, perm, an attempt to perm sort of thing, um, then it changes the dynamics of your relationship fundamentally. Because you came in as the interim, and now suddenly you, you know, you're they're looking at you as a potential permanent. Um, and a, a couple of times I was tempted early on uh, doing this when they said, "Oh, would you consider you know, applying?" I thought, oh yes, I'd love to do this. I think they're great. Um, and then the relationship changed, and it was actually really difficult for me to finish off the brief that I was there to deliver because mm. you know, the dynamics were changing. So I think you just got to be really careful about how that can undermine your actually undermine your credibility, and particularly with the staff because they think, oh well, it, so it was a you know, a, a, you know a, a, a sidling into the role rather than a direct open and transparent process which it may well be anyway but it's but perception can be very um important there i made a decision right at the beginning with that very first interim role that um partly that sidling in thing uh but i made it a principle that i live by that wherever i do the interim i do not apply for the permanent so much as I would have liked a lot of those jobs, I say right up front, um, because they, they will be going through a process. They've spent the money recruiting me as the interim. They will still go through because their policies and procedures and processes say that we have to go out to advert for the permanent and they will spend the money again. And if that's to end up with me, that feels like a bit of a waste of time and money so I would rather my efforts are used in helping them to move through the work that we've agreed bring in the new person uh, and help the new person settle in if that's what they want um, what that has meant is those periods where um, I, I mean if I'd done that I would never have faced those things about well we won't appoint you because you're an interim I would have just seamlessly moved into jobs that I I would have liked um, it creates that gap in income um, at times and you kind of think okay the safety of knowing what you're doing each day can feel a, a bit daunting but it feels fundamentally right as a value principle for me to say that I won't do it I'm not saying it's right for everybody but for me it feels like I'm able to be authentic um about what i'm doing with that up front and and what do you think trustees should be looking for when recruiting an interim what advice would you have to to clients particularly at trustee level i'll, I'll just um say often trustees think that they can shove everything into the brief because oh we've got this interim they can fix all of these things <laughs> And they make it too big. And then they're disappointed when they see people who kind of go, hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure that you can do this. Um, I think being really clear about what it is you want to achieve by having an interim. And if it is just steady state, that's of value as much as we want to have a change process inevitably there is change by having an interim in there because they see things and can say do you want to fix this so uh my interviews with trustees some I get and some I don't I say to them whatever you've set out here we'll have that as a marker but after I've done that first four weeks and seen everything then I will go back and negotiate with you what it is we actually do 
um, because then you have the clarity about what can be done. Uh, and that might be disappointing for some people that they feel, but we wanted all of these things done, but it was unrealistic in the first place. So being realistic about what one person can do over six months on the hours that are available, um, uh, you know, uh, is the best thing trustees can do is just be, you know, have a reality check. Would they be able to do it if they were in the role? And I think often they roll over six months, don't they? The plan is six months, but increasingly, yeah, <clears throat> we see it going to nine, yeah. ten. Um, Darcy, anything else to add there for, from the trustee's perspective? Yeah, I think that that being realistic about your brief, you know, you know what 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 do we really want to be addressed in that time period um, or in in the period in which we have the the interim with us um, and I've seen a sort of brief of you know with you know 18 I, I, I know, items on there you go well that's just not you know sensible to be focusing on that um, but it's um, so it is having that negotiation being candid up front when you're pitching for the piece of work to say you know what you think is actually realistic mm -hmm. and as, as Elizabeth said of course and 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 the reality check once you're in, because you know, often they, and when you're talking to trustees um, before you start the work, they say, do you have any more questions for us? And I go, well, I'll have lots of questions for you, but I don't know what they might be yet. And it's once, you know, so what I need from you is a commitment of your time early on so I can talk to you about actually how we need to define that brief. Um, and it is about sort of unconditional positive regard for everyone you're working yeah. You know, and so you know, how do we make sure we're doing this together? Because I am there to be your interim, and not your next permanent, and we don't want it to turn into an overly long period of time because that's not healthy for the organisation. So when they say, "Well, can you come in for a month, sort it all out, and recruit, and we'll recruit the next CEO," you're going, "Well, that's not going to happen in a month, is it?" You know, because the recruitment process, if done properly, is is three months um and then you might have another three months while you're waiting for that perfect person to join because they're they're, they're serving their notice so that's six months and but you probably need a three-month period before you get to the recruitment process of dealing with the issues that you're there to deal with so it, most most of my interim roles are about nine months in reality because that's how it works out um and i say that to any of my clients that i will stay with you for as long as you need me but for no longer so you know, if we get to the point sooner, I'll step away and I have no problem with that. Um, if, if it needs a bit longer, don't worry, I've committed myself to you and I, and I will stay you there. But it's not to turn it, me, myself into a de facto permanent CEO. And the language you use, Darcy, um, unconditional positive regard, person-centred therapy <laughs> is essentially what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you don't know Carl Rogers, go and look at a bit of Carl Rogers <laughs> and yeah. learn uh, about being there um, and having that unconditional positive regard uh, for people. It's not always easy because you're not going to like everyone. Um, that you, you can go in from that, yeah. And actually, what's one of the nice things about being a permanent is you do get to work in lots of different areas. And one of the things I always try and do is take some form of uh, training in in the in the in the, in the, uh, the the charitable objective. So when I was running the BPC, the British Psychoanalytic Council, I did a a, a counselling course. Uh, didn't make me a counsellor. He gave me an insight into what that was, and that was great. And I learned a lot from doing that. And that's really nice to to engage. But that's not where you're there. You're not there to become the next expert. And I'm training to be a counsellor because I, my interim work has led me running loads of organisations that have um, psychotherapy as part of their offer. Um, and I reached a point where I thought, well, if I'm going to keep doing this. I ought to know more. <laughs> so, you know, opportunity so. for for learning in in most uh, examples there that you've gained. Yeah. There's um there's some interest quite rightly in you know the most difficult interim roles you've had, and I think specifically around encountering any clash in in values and culture, uh, and and how you've been able to approach that perhaps. 
Um, okay, yes, I, I uh, and this is that bit about the boundary around confidentiality. So uh, there was one organisation where I did have to, uh, the easier ones are you look at people's um, governing documents and you realise they're operating outside of, of them and you, you get everyone to understand you have to stop doing that and fix it. The harder ones are where you see behaviours that have been allowed to go on and no one has tackled them. Um, and you then have to be the person who tackles that. And you leave knowing that people have been harmed. And how do you hold that confidentiality for them as much as for the organisation? Because you might have worked with them uh, around something and not talking about that can sit quite difficult. You know, it's it's, it's difficult. We're in a we're in a world where everyone feels that they have to share all of this. But I often think about the person who it's happened to. Um, and they may not want their story out there. It's theirs to tell, not mine, to say this is what I saw in this organization. Um, uh, the bit for me is you make it known. And I can't control what happens after I leave, but I have made it known. And I think that's one of the um, you know, advantages of being the interim, that you can tackle things really soon, really quickly. Um, I mean, I think you do that as a permanent anyway, but um, you know, as part of as part of that brief is to, you know, you are putting the organization in the best possible position it can be to move forward and addressing those things and those and they can be quite challenging cultural changes um i, I will tell this story but i won't attribute it to anyone <laughs> um was one um one board was working with as an interim ceo at the end of the first board meeting the chair said to me of course darcy um if you do as i say we're going to get on really well um and the implication was if if i didn't you know, there would be problems and i said to him i don't deal with bullies um, and that was uh, gave me a really nasty you know, uh, few months where he was really aggressive about everything and, and really pushed against me. And I pushed back uh, in, in, a, in a nice, positive way and, and, and showed how we can work better governance and, and didn't rise to that. Um, and then once he saw actual positive change, he backed down. Um, I didn't he didn't turn into a lovely, cuddly person, but you know, he, the respect was there. Um, so you need to you need to be robust enough to handle that. Um, and you might find that is more prevalent in the interim roles than you would find going into a permanent role because the, you're going into organizations that are in flux. There's a lot of fear um, and people react to fear in very different ways. And, and, and people often say they love change. The reality is most people don't like change. They find it quite, quite difficult to deal with. So going in, understanding that will help you address it when you see it. But um, don't let it run on any any uh, any longer than it can, because the longer you leave it, the more difficult it comes to tackle. So when I was uh, quite a young leader, um, uh, I learned that lesson about people and change with just trying to do a slight shift around the office to add an extra desk in. And one person was so entrenched in their desk could not move at all. and. The focus was on a plant, <laughs> you know, a physical plant that they had growing on a windowsill. Um, and it took me quite a long time to unpick that it wasn't the plant that was the issue. It was their fear uh, about the change. And I, I hold that in my head all the time. What is somebody's plant <laughs> that's going on here? Um, and try and ensure that, um, that I... I have my antenna out trying to pick up what the fear signals are with people. And you can't promise everything to people. People want reassurance all the time. And sometimes you have to say, I can't give you the reassurance you need. Change is inevitable here. We can go through it together and I'll be there to support you with this. And that has uh, that's also gone on so beyond the time 
with some people. So new chief execs coming in where I have been the interim often call me a year later or, you know, two years mm -hmm. later <laughs> with something. And they'll say, oh, can you remember? And they're asking me something very practical. And underneath it is I need a chat about what's happening in the organisation. And I think it's been quite helpful that you've um, often talked about being an interim while an organisation is recruiting their permanent chief mm. executive. And great that you've then <clears throat> been in touch, perhaps, you know, uh, as they needed you due to once they're in post. But tell me a little bit more about your particular involvement, perhaps in working with trustees to recruit the permanent CEO. Is, is that something that you've got uh, involved with directly? Yeah. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> sorry. Is this... No, go. go okay. Um, yeah. Almost um, every time. Um, that's part. And I see that as part of my um, support for the board. Um, and if you know, you may be going to look at um, a particular part of the organisation as as the interim CEO. But one thing that you're always working on is the group, the development of the board, and helping them grow and develop, and putting themselves in the strong position for the future. So you might be helping them um, grow their the board, recruit uh, trustees. But you know, you're there to to help the organisation be in the best possible position it is can be to recruit the right trustee, uh, right CEO to move on. And it isn't going to be the job description of the one who's left. It's you know, and I've seen that lots of times. They said, oh, we've got a job description. Well, that's the one you yeah. removed or the one who left or no, what it was. So we need to start again, really. So helping them do that, helping them understand what a good in, um, recruitment process is, because they may not have gone through it before. Um, and often acting as the, um, the facilitator between the, the recruiter um, and um, and the trustees to make sure that things stay on track and everyone is 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 uh, focused correctly. Um, so yeah, no, and I enjoy doing that because that uh, that helps me ensure that the right person is is in in position. Not that I'm having a vote in that role. Mm. Yeah, sorry, prospectus. Sometimes I don't use a recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> they just have me do everything. So one of the things I talk to them about is budget. Um, what the, you know, go back to basics about the role. So if they're saying this, it, we need to be clear about what the role is going to be paid. Most uh, you get quite a lot of applicants who say, "I know we have this with small charities coalition." In fact, um, you're only offering this much, but I'm worth this much more. And kind of go, well, then you're not going to be the person for the organization because we haven't got that much more um uh to pay up front if you can bring in the money then you might be able to get to that point so it's being really clear about where the red lines are for people um uh but when you're then using a recruiter being really clear about the timetables are on all of this so if you have a recruiter that says that's unrealistic, listen to them. <laughs> People don't understand if they want to do a deep search, you can't do that in two days. You know, reaching out to people does not happen. So people have unrealistic expectations about what it is they want and what can be done. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I've done both, uh, including, you know, uh, putting out a tender brief to all of the recruiters uh, and shortlisting and doing the interview process uh, with the trustees for that through to doing the recruitment directly. And I know that that individuals, you know, candidates for those permanent chief executive roles find it incredibly helpful and useful to talk to the interim that's mm -hmm. imposed <clears throat> so they decide uh, whether to go forward with it or not and understand a bit more. Um, so just some, some final queries, um, both from the Q&A and, and any sort of final insights either of you wanted to share, really. Um, there's some interest in, in the biggest gap that you've had between different interim roles. Um, again, a little bit more about anything about how the best way to become an interim leader. Um, and yeah, again, you know, any um, any time when you've gone on to be permanent after an interim, which we, <clears throat> we touched a bit on earlier. So any final thoughts on that would be really welcome. Your turn to go first, Liz. Um, in terms of gap, I think the longest was nine months. Um, 
between interim roles, uh, which was a bit scary if, if you've handed over all your consultancy clients. Um, I forgot what the first one was. Sorry, my brain disappeared there, which was... That was the biggest gap. And then again, entry into being an interim. Right, and then the entry... Yeah. Yeah. And then the entry in, um, I think this is if you are interested in doing it and you are in a permanent role, then apply for an interim and see what the process looks like. Um, you know, you haven't lost anything at that point if you need to keep that stability. If you do want to go gung ho, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to go. Um, You've had this. Uh, people often ask me, I won't be telling you anything different. I have individual conversations with me about becoming an interim. But plan, make sure you've got a buffer. Make sure you've got some money saved before you give up the comfort of a permanent role, because there will be a, a gap before you go into um, your first interim role. And don't be afraid of saying what I have learned in a lower role is transferable to mm. to being a CEO interim. Mm. You've got nothing to lose at this point. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I might just add, you know, um, don't just take anything, you know, yeah. because you are, and is, you are your brand. You need to decide who you are, what you're selling, how you're going to sell it. Um, and you can do all that before you kick off. Um, and have a have a have a marketing plan you know uh, put your business plan together you know it, it's you you know do that work as if it was a, you know you were setting up a new company um so that you really understand what you're going to do i also had um I, it's now embedded in my brain but i had a um a, a fallback diary so i created my my week and divided every day up into things i would do at that period of time if i wasn't doing something paid work or anything else so that you are always motivated and um, because you know if you particularly if you've been used to working in an organization for a long period of time and it's suddenly being self-employed um as a as a consultant and going into the interim world is that you need to make sure you've got that rigor and it really helps you stay focused and gives you and it gives you a confidence in your day and i found that really really helped helped a lot um, and and put yourself out there. You know, go, you know mm. go to go to networking groups. Even if you don't like networking, get used to doing it. I mean, I I started off doing it with um, uh, just BNI, and you know, Business Network International, which isn't aimed at consultancies or charities particularly. It's aimed at generally local businesses um, because I was able to practice. Um, and I did it as a as when I was a permanent CEO talking about my charity never went in there with a begging bill always went in there with a business to business proposition but that's what you need to have as as a as a, as a consultant um whether that's to do the interim high level or lower level or doing the small bits is this is what i'm offering and this is what i'm not offering be really clear of that lovely yeah, and, and you also then tell people oh yeah no but this one will finish in a few months so when people ask you what you're doing, you, they've got that as well. They yeah, know that let, you'll be available again. Yeah, let people know, and let people know. No, this is what no, uh, this is what I learned in my last um, my last role without you know breaking any confidentialities. Um, my longest period, I think, was um, wasn't quite as long as nine months. Um, it was it was longer than I intended because I I made the mistake of think had a, a long um, interim role which was very tricky, and I thought, right, I'm going to take some time out now and I'll have a bit of a holiday. And then I'll start looking for an interim role and actually turned down two interim roles that came in quite quickly, thinking, oh, I know I've, I've promised myself this holiday. Mm. Um, and then when, when I finished the holiday and got bored, basically, um, then the course wasn't anything around. You know, so you know, I, I created a longer gap than it needed to be. But don't just think because you've finished one, you need to take the next one. If you need a break, take the break, take break. Right? And, and, and build and build it into your head that that's why you're paid a day rate is so that it compensates you for, for you know, not being paid to have a holiday. But effectively, you're being paid as part of that um, day rate. I think on the, the cheery point of holidays, <laughs> we will leave it there. Um, thank you so much, Darcy, Elizabeth, for your candor insight um and you know knowledge uh, that you've built up uh, over the years 
Um, I really hope for everybody that was able to join us, you know, it's given you some ideas about the pros and cons of engaging an interim, um, how to get the most out of an interim appointment or perhaps becoming an interim yourself. Uh, I hope it's been an interesting discussion. And once again, thanks so much, Darcy and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you for Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.